American 11 Heavy Boss Time, Taxi 2, Runway United 175 Heavy, Runway 9 Air, cleared for takeoff. American 77, your departure frequency will be 125. September the 11th, 2001. Voices crackle over the airwaves as terrorists seize control of the skies. This is the story of 9-11, told by newly released audio recordings made that day that reveal the chaos behind the true events of 9-11. Our number one got staff. A first-class galley flight attendant and our purser in staff. We wing have a hijack. We have some problems over here right now. I'm on a plane that's been hijacked. I hope to be able to see your face again, baby. I love you. Another one just hit the building. Wow. Wow. Another one just hit it hard. Another one just hit the world side. On the morning of September the 11th, 2001, air traffic controllers in Boston start another busy day. The U.S. Air 1995, cleared for takeoff. Departure is 1995, departure. We basically guide aircraft from one end of the country to the other end of the country. They do use airways, and airways are just like roadways. So really not much difference. We have a first morning push in the morning. You know, it starts roughly 6.30 to 7, kind of like rush hour in any, any, any other big city. And we say safe and efficient, because everyone can't go direct. If everyone came direct, everyone meet at the same point. But we want to be as efficient as possible, so we try to get as many aircraft on the way as quickly as we can. American 11 cleared for takeoff. Wind 330 at 9 Eric. At the height of the morning rush hour, American Airlines Flight 11 departs Boston headed to Los Angeles. All communications are routinely recorded. American 11 Boston, center of climbing, a little bit 280. American 11 turn 20 degrees, right? We managed to clear. But 13 minutes into the flight, controller Peter Zalewski loses contact with the cockpit. American 11, climbing table level 350. American 11, Boston. Silence is real scary for a control. We develop a three-dimensional picture in our head telling us what we have, and we, we know where everybody is. And if you ever lose that picture, that's a very, very scary feeling. You get a pit in your stomach. American 11, if you hear Boston Center, I can please or acknowledge. The biggest thing you need on an airplane to work is their radios. If you don't have their radios, you have no control. We had lost radio contact with them, and then we almost simultaneously lost their transponder. It's like it's turning right. Yeah, Pretty much makes your, your plane kind of invisible. Trying to identify that aircraft to other people now becomes more difficult. He will not respond to me now. He I'm won't answer you. He's Nardo. Roger. Right. Thank you. United 175 Heavy Runway 9 Air cleared for takeoff. Cleared for takeoff Runway 9 Air 175 As concerns grow over American 11, Boston Air Traffic Control has dozens of other scheduled flights to deal with. Among them is United Airlines 175 also headed for Los Angeles. While United 175 sets course for LA, a voice from the air is about to reveal the chaos unfolding on board American 11. From the back of the aircraft, flight attendant Betty Ong calls an American Airlines operator on the ground. Hello? My 
name is Betty Ong. I'm number three in the back. Um, the cockpit's not answering. Somebody stabbed in business class. And um, I think there's mates that we can't breathe. And I don't know. I think we'll get in high debt. Which flight are you on? I'm number three on flight 11. Okay, you're the flight attendant? Yes. And the cockpit is not answering their phone. American 11 has been hijacked by five men, and they have stormed their way into the cockpit. Our number one is the gut staff. Um, our first class galley flight attendant and our purser is in staff. And we can't get into the cockpit. The door won't open. I think Betty sounds very much in control. I just can't imagine what it would have been like to be inside the, the aircraft, um, not knowing what was going to happen. Can anybody get up to the cockpit? I think the guys are up there. They might have jammed their way up there or, or something. Nobody can call the cockpit. We can't even get inside. The supervisor keeps Betty on the line and calls an emergency number to report the hijack. American Airlines emergency line, please state your emergency. Hey, this is Nitty, the American Airlines calling. I am monitoring a call in which flight 11, the flight attendant is advising our reps that the pilot, everyone's been stabbed. Flight 11? Yep. They can't get into the cockpit is what I'm hearing. Okay. I have the flight attendant on the line with one of our agents. Okay. Okay, I'm still on with security, okay, Betty? You're doing a great job. Just, just stay calm, okay? Okay, we're contacting a flight crew now. We're all con uh, we're also contacting ATC. Okay. okay. They are in the cockpit with the pilot. The hijackers now have control of American 11 and are flying the aircraft themselves. They turn south, deviating from its flight plan. In an attempt to calm the passengers, lead hijacker Mohammed Atta accidentally broadcasts over the airwaves. We have some planes, just stay quiet and you'll be okay. We are turning to the airport. American 11, are you trying to call? Nobody moves. Everything will be okay. If you try to make any move, you will danger yourself and the airplane. Just stay quiet. The supervisor came in and said, we think we just heard Something on the frequency, it sounded like threats, and he believed the aircraft was hijacked. It was like, whoa, you know, what's really going on here? The hijackers continue to fly American 11 south. In Herndon, Virginia, at the command center of the Federal Aviation Administration, news of the hijack still hasn't broken. With overriding control of the skies above America, they will need to coordinate any response. <clears throat> Starting his first day in charge of the operations floor is Ben Sliney. The day was brilliant. It was absolutely clear, no wind problems. There was no weather at all from Maine to Florida. And I said to myself, well, that's, a, that's gonna be a real easy first day. I had uh, prepared myself for a briefing to be given at 8.30, and the supervisor caught up to me to say, that there was a possible hijacking out of Boston. The possibility of a hijacking is not something that uh, the air traffic system is unfamiliar with. And there are protocols, and I was quite comfortable that my staff and all the air traffic controllers knew those protocols quite well. And I told the supervisor to keep me informed. With Boston Air Traffic Control taking the lead, information about American 11 is passed on quickly to the surrounding control centers. But the problem is, Nobody knows where the aircraft is headed. Actually, the New York, Boston, uh, I got a little situation with American 1 1 and American 11. We don't know where the aircraft is going, and we lost this transponder, and now the aircraft is headed due south. Oh, oh, my goodness. You have no idea where he's going? No idea, sir. Okay. I'm okay. Thank you. Thank you. We're used to being in control. You tell an aircraft to do something, they do it. You climb, you descend, you turn, you see it on the radar, it's done. In this case, we had no control. We had no idea what this guy was going to do. Flying off course and at great speed, 
The hijacked American 11 sets a new route. Destination, New York City. As the hijacked American 11 continues on its new flight path, at the Federal Aviation Administration's command center, Ben Sliney is informed of a stabbing on board the aircraft. This was a radical uh, departure from anything I was experienced with. Uh, American 11 had made a left descending turn to the south. So the aircraft, we figured, may have been trying to go to New York. The terrorists are now only 100 miles from their target. Hijacker Mohammed Atta tries to reassure the passengers on board they will be safe. Nobody move, please. We're going to back to the airport. Don't try to make any stupid moves. At the time of 9-11, the defense of the northeast coast of America was in the hands of NEADS the Northeast Air Defense Sector. In charge that day is Colonel Bob Marr, who's preparing for a military exercise, codename Vigilant Guardian. On September 11th, we were beginning an exercise. It was going to be a week-long type war game where nobody was going to get hurt, and it gave you the opportunity to make mistakes and have them pointed out. So it wasn't going to be an easy week by any means, but it was a simulation. As NEADS waits for the war game to begin, in Boston air traffic control, the hijack of American 11 is escalating. American 11, if you hear Boston Center, I can please or acknowledge. Controller Joseph Cooper is told by his supervisor to break protocol and call the military directly to ask for help. We had noticed the aircraft had turned south and they'd actually increased in speed. It was going faster for some reason. I called NEADS to advise them that we had a hijack. You know, it was confirmed. I just weapon, Sergeant Powell. All right, Boston Center, Team U. We have a, a problem here. We have a hijacked aircraft headed towards New York, and we need you guys to scramble some F-16s or something up there to help us out. Is this, is this real world or exercise? No, this is not an exercise manifest. When I gave him that information, it appeared he didn't believe me because he asked me if it was real time or not. Um, <clears throat> you know, at this point, I guess it's you know, and this guy's moving fast. And he's headed southbound, and we have no idea what he's doing. Just help us somehow, some way. Hey, 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 He handed me off to someone else. I assume it was his superior. Hi, this is Major Destin. Joe Cooper, Boston Center. We yeah, have Jeff. a hijacked aircraft headed towards the New York metro area. Wondering if he could um, send someone up there, some F-16s or something. Okay. Maybe out of Otis. Okay. But confusion begins because air traffic control and the military talk in different technical jargons and don't understand each other. Do you have a mode three on it? No, Do you have a mode three no it's just the primary target only. We lost, um, we lost the uh, mode, mode C on it. I felt panicked. My heart was pounding, you know, and I just, you know, and I was just hoping for something, somewhere to, someone, someone to help us out. News of the hijacking of American 11 filters through to the floor of NEAD's control room. The military personnel are unprepared. What? Oh. Is that real world? Oh, 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 cool. Real? Where is it? Boston? Yep. To find out more about the hijack, an identification technician calls Boston Air Traffic Control. Colin Scoggins answers the call. Uh, yeah, Hunter's calling uh, in reference to the hijack aircraft. Yes. We need call sign type aircraft. It's uh, American 11 type aircraft. Is a uh, 767. Do you have a mode three? No, we don't. He's a primary target only. Primary target only? Yeah. At that time, I kept telling him it was a primary target, but uh, during that time period between the military and the FAA, that term probably had two different meanings. So they still want to know what the code is and I'm trying to explain to them that there is no code and that they need to pick up this primary target. He took off out of Boston originally heading for uh, Los Angeles. Where are they going now, do you know? We, we don't know. <laughs> you don't know where he is at all? We don't know. We don't know where he's going. He's uh, 35 miles north of Kennedy now at 367 knots. Okay. We'll call you right back as soon as we know more info. 
Thank you. Okay. A lot of frustration because we've been trying to tell them where the aircraft was and they just couldn't identify it. As the technicians struggle to locate American 11, Colonel Bob Marr mobilizes the military's first air defense response. My first call then was, we need to put these guys on battle stations. What battle stations does is puts the pilots in the cockpit. NEADS has two Air Force bases on the East Coast, with fighter jets at their immediate disposal. The closest to American 11's flight path is Otis Air Base Cape Cod, 190 miles from New York City. On the NEADS control room floor, mission crew commander Nisipani and senior weapons director Fox prepare to get the fighter jets airborne. Find this guy, mode 3, 1443. It's the last known position that we got out of this guy. It was right there at the Z point. He's heading 190 at 29,000 feet. This is the real world. Okay, run the high check that we got out of this guy. Now you're in this period of trying to get fighters in the air, trying to locate the track of interest, the hijacked aircraft, get the fighters pointing in the right direction. But American 11 is now just minutes away from New York City and descending fast. On board the aircraft, flight attendant Betty Yong has been struggling to tell ground staff what's going on. OK, the aircraft is erratic again. Problem, very erratic. What's going on on your end, Craig? They have him on a primary radar. They seem to think that he is descending. Okay. What's going on, Betty? Betty, talk to me. Betty, are you there? Betty? We, I think we might have lost her. Moments after communication with American 11 is lost, Niaz is still trying to get fighters in the air. I don't know where I'm scrambling these guys to. I need a direction, uh, destination. Okay, I'm going to give you the Z point. It's just north of uh, New York City. Head them in that direction. Copy that. Finally, the fighters are scrambled. There's a puncher with an active air defense scramble for Panta 4546. Immediately. But the jets are held on the tarmac, while the military continues to try and work out the exact coordinates to send them to. Just 40 seconds after the scramble order is given, Mohammed Atta flies American 11 into the North Tower of the World Trade Center. Confusion hits the airwaves of surrounding air traffic control centers as reports that the signal for American 11 has disappeared from radar. Looks like we lost the primary target about 20 west of Kennedy. Well, we lost the track, so. Yeah, New York confirms we've lost the track as well. Are you serious? Kennedy Tower reports that there was fire at the World Trade Center. And that's, uh, that's the area where we lost the airplane. Soon after the impact, news reports hit the airwaves speculating what may have happened. We understand that there has been a plane crash on the uh, southern tip of Manhattan. You're looking at the uh, World Trade Center. We understand that a plane has crashed into the World Trade Center. We don't know anything more than that. We don't know if it was a commercial aircraft. We don't know if it was a private aircraft. We have no idea. In the air, other pilots above New York are confused by what they are seeing. Anybody know what that smoke is? A lot of smoke in lower Manhattan. A lot of smoke in lower Manhattan? Out of the uh, top of the World Trade Center building, a major fire. 
everyone was just like in shock and disbelief. You know, it's like you couldn't even think straight. It's like, oh my God, the worst thing for air traffic. You know, you trained your whole life. Um, number one safety, keep them separated, keep them safe. So we just lost. And that was the feeling you had, you lost. Chaos has come to the heart of New York, but the terror has only just begun. As reports of a small aircraft impacting the World Trade Center circulate the airwaves, at the Federal Aviation Administration's command center, reality is dawning. I knew, and anyone in air traffic control and aviation knew, that that was no small aircraft that had struck the World Trade Center. I had a very bad feeling when I saw the size of the of the fire and smoke and the and obviously something huge had hit that building. At the Northeast Air Defense Sector, news of the crash also breaks. This is what I got. Hospital news at 737 just hit the World Trade Center. This is real world. And we're trying to confirm this. Oh my god. Oh god. We had a report that a uh, light aircraft had hit the World Trade Center. We had a report that a uh, landing gear off an aircraft had hit the World Trade Center. I think there was even a call that a commuter aircraft had hit the World Trade Center. Last I knew they had a primary on it. The worst possible situation in my mind at the time was that there had been some terrible accident. Just do what we gotta do, okay? Without confirmation that American 11 is involved in the crash, the military maintains its objective. The mission had not changed. There was no guarantee that, that the hijacking was over, and so the fighters were still getting out there. Send them to New York City, still continue to go. Air defense fighters finally take to the skies, seven minutes after American 11 impacts the North Tower. Make sure that the FAA clears your route all the way through. Just do what we gotta do. They are a step behind the hijackers. 147 miles from Otis Air Base is New York Air Traffic Control Center, which handles one of the busiest airspaces in the world. Controller Dave Battiglia has 19 years of experience working these routes, and he's about to be caught in the middle of the second phase of the terrorist attack. United 175, play direct spotter. Party, United 175. United Airlines Flight 175 which departed Boston 15 minutes after American 11, suddenly changes its transponder code. Air 175, recycle your transponder, score code to 1470. United 175, New York. United 175, do you read New York? United 175 originally was talking to me, and now he's gone. But then what happens is the code changes. And I'm still not as concerned until I started to watch them make a climb, a very fast rate of climb without any control instruction. United, United 175, do you read New York? United 175, do you read New York? At that point, I got a little scared. Because now things are starting to, you know how you put two and two together. And I'm starting to think, well, American 11 got hijacked. United's out of Boston also. Fearing the worst, Batiglia calls a colleague. Hello, do me a favor. You see that target there, the 3321 code at 335 climbing? We, we have a hijack. We have some problems over here right now. Oh, you do? Yes. And okay. That, that may be real traffic. Nobody knows. I can't get a hold of the United 175 at all right now. And I don't know where he went to. All right, okay. As soon as I finish the call, I turn to the facility chief and says, I think I have another hijack. On board United 175, desperate passengers try to call their loved ones. Brian Sweeney leaves a message for his wife, Julie. Uh, listen, on an airplane, missing a hijack. Things will go well. I'm good to go. I just want you to know I absolutely love you. I want you to do good. So happy to find uh, things to my parents and everybody. 
I knew he was saying goodbye. And I remember when he said, I'll see you when you get here. Um, here to him was where he was going. And in his belief, you, you meet up with everybody once you get there. So he said goodbye. And he told me to live my life and be happy and move on, move forward. And I knew he was gone then. I just, I knew it. Now on course for New York City, United Airlines Flight 175 is just minutes away from impact. Just four minutes after New York Center loses contact with United Airlines 175, the terrorist attack is evolving fast. United 175, do you read New York? The next phase is about to begin. At Indianapolis Air Traffic Control, a third aircraft, American Airlines Flight 77, en route from Washington to Los Angeles, also stops responding. American 77, Indy. American 77, Indy. American 77, American Indy. Sometimes a guy will flip the switch by accident. Uh, then you see him turn. You know, that's not good. American 77, Indy radio check. How do you read? You're thinking, oh my gosh, he has an emergency. Once you realize there's a problem and a guy's Losing control of the airplane, that's a very difficult thing to, because you can't do anything. You, can, you, you can't do anything. As American Airlines Flight 77 deviates from its flight plan, in New York, concern grows amongst controllers as United 175 begins a fast ascent into the heart of the city. Hello. Hey, Joe, you see 3321 code just southwest of Newark by about 15, 18, 20 miles. 15,000 descending. They were tracking him, made a hard left turn. He's descending pretty rapidly, especially what just happened in there. This guy's a big boy because he's leaving some big contrails. Do you know who he is? We just, we just, we don't know who he is. We're just picking him up now. All right, heads up, man. It looks like another one. All right. United 175 was descending at an extremely rapid rate of descent, something I've never, ever seen that fast a rate of descent. Normally, they would descend at 1,500 feet a minute. This airplane was going down every 12 and a half seconds, 2,000 feet. That's a tremendous rate of descent. Hey, can you look out your window right now? Yeah. Can you, can you see God about 4,000 feet, about 5 east of the airport right now? Yeah, I see him. Is he descending for the building also? He's descending really quick too, yeah. Well, that's 2,500 feet now. He just dropped 800 feet in like, a, like one, one sweep. <laughs> Everybody was in shock. You're watching something on a radar scope, and you see the target disappear. Now somebody comes in and yells, an airplane just hit the Trade Center. Now, both of those together paints a picture in your mind that you'll never forget. We didn't actually see the crash, but we watched everything happen unfold on the scope. When United 175 struck that building, there was a collective gasp in that room, and it was just all the air had gone out of that room. And it was the most horrifying thing that uh, I could ever imagine seeing, a, a air carrier loaded, as far as I knew, with hundreds of people uh, crashing into that building and that jet fuel exploding. The image of that plane, I think, will be ingrained in everybody's memory for the rest of their lives. 
The bottom line is you are watching the last seconds of your loved one's life alive and then you watch them die. I remember watching on the screen that second tower get hit. And that, for me, really was the tipping point. That no longer meant there was a terrible accident, which was the worst that we could think of before. Now this is definitely a terrorist attack. That meant that New York City was under attack and that we needed to protect New York City. Okay, we need to talk to FAA. We need to tell them if this stuff's gonna keep on going, we need to take those fighters, put them over Manhattan. If there's more out there, which we don't know, let's get them over Manhattan. At least we've got some kind of play. But despite air defense jets being 12 minutes outside of New York, they are heading to the wrong city. Next on the terrorist plan of attack is the nation's capital. Amidst the speed of the terrorist attacks, confusion now hits the airwaves. In Boston Center, Colin Scoggins receives a conflicting report about the first plane that hit the towers. I heard a report that American 11 was still airborne. So I immediately called the Northeast Air Defense Command there in the ads and advised them that American 11 was still in the air. The military at Boston Center just had a report that American 11 is still in the air. It's heading towards Washington. American 11 is still in the air yes. on its way to Washington. Another, it was definitely another aircraft that hit the tower. That's the latest report we have. So American 11 isn't a hijack at all then, right? No, he is a hijack. He, American 11 is a hijack? Yes. And this he's going into third, Washington? This could be a third aircraft. Things just never stopped. They just kept rolling. And there was obviously confusion because it wasn't correct. OK, uh, American Airlines is still airborne. 11, the first guy, he's heading towards Washington. I'm going to take the fighters from Otis and try to chase this guy down if I can find him. At that moment, we felt like we had no control of any airspace. We didn't know what was going on with aircraft right and left. Is it not just New York and Washington? Is it possibly Detroit? Is it possibly Chicago? What's the next point? How many of these are there out there? And we don't know. Things just morphed after that. They just kind of exploded. Foxy, scramble Langley, head towards the Washington area. Niad scrambles Langley Air Force Base in Hampton, Virginia, 128 miles from Washington, D.C. Estimated flight time to the capital, 15 minutes. With two hijacked aircraft down and American 77 unaccounted for, a fourth and final aircraft is about to complete the terrorist plan of attack. Good morning, New York. United 93 with 25 and a half for Toledo. United 93, New York. Center. Good morning. United 93 had taken off out of Newark International. But 46 minutes into the flight, controllers in Cleveland hear the actual moment hijackers storm the cockpit. United 93, verify 350. We hear some funny noises. We're trying to get him. Do you okay. have him? No. United 93, Cleveland. United 1523, did you hear uh, screaming? Yes, I did, and uh, I, we couldn't tell what it was either. What is going on here? I got the piston down. Keep remaining sitting. We have a ball board. Fearing the worst, the Cleveland controllers act quickly, clearing all aircraft out of United 93's way. Aircraft we believe was transmitting is 12 o'clock, flying five miles, turn left, heading 225, I'll get you away from him. 16 Mike Fox, shot by heading 120, to get you away from that. Going 120, I'm heading Mike Fox. He's climbing, so I want to keep everybody away from him. United 93 continues to climb erratically. In Washington, Controllers are still anxiously trying to track the third hijacked aircraft, American 77, which has entered their airspace. Boom, I see him on the radar. I was like, wow, who is this guy? What's he doing? What's going on? He over to my supervisor, Vic. He picks up the phone right away. Hunter's ID, unsecure line. 
Hunter's ID, this is Washington Center, the operations manager. Uh, okay, we were looking, we also lost American 77. He was going to LA also. He was also going to LA. The Indianapolis Center was working this guy. They lost radar with him, they lost contact with him, they lost everything, and they don't have any idea what happened. Thank you, sir. Thanks. In Boston, Colin Scoggins has learned an unidentified aircraft is closing in on the nation's capital. He's unaware it's American 77. A call came over the telecom stating that there was an aircraft six miles southwest of the White House. And I called Neads up. Uh, latest report, the aircraft VFR is six miles southeast of the White House. Six miles southeast of the White House? Yep. It was tough, because you know, at that point you know he's going to hit something. I didn't to grasp the reality is this airplane is going to run into the White House. But American 77 suddenly changes direction. It was a very helpless feeling, and my supervisor yelled, anybody got a military? Anybody got a military? And we had this military C-130. And he says, have that guy follow that guy. Turn, follow him, and see if you can see where he's going. Go for a 06, traffic is 11 o'clock and five miles northbound, fast moving, type and altitude unknown. Go for a 06, we have the traffic, do you know what kind it is, can you see? Looks like a 757, sir. Looks like he's at no altitude right now, sir. Go for 86, turn right and follow the traffic, please. And then he made a hard right turn and his ground speed started clicking up, clicking up, clicking up, clicking up as he's descending the whole time and he was going about, about 500 miles an hour. That's an extreme speed. That's the speed you see at 35,000 feet. You don't see 500 miles an hour, you know, 100 feet off the ground, which is about where he was. When he dropped off for scope. Edmond, Washington, this is for 06. Scott? Yes, sir, the aircraft is down. Looks like that aircraft crashed into the Pentagon, sir. As American 77 impacts the Pentagon, Air defense jets are still 29 minutes away from Washington, D.C. The nation's capital is defenseless and under direct attack. To hear that the Pentagon had been hit, it was pretty much all afterward. Uh, we already had the F-16s in the air. Uh, we were already trying to get them vectored towards Washington, D.C. Basically, we have no involvement with American Airlines 77. This was now spreading, and uh... We had to start really worrying about aircraft all over the country, where they were coming from, and uh, that really nobody was safe. With three hijacked aircraft down, United 93 remains airborne. Hijacker Zia Jara broadcasts across the airwaves. Hi, uh, the captain, I would like to all the remain in We are all on the board, and we are going to take the airport, and we have our demand, so please remain quiet. In the aircraft cabin, fearing for their lives, passengers try to call their loved ones. Mark Bingham gets through to his mother at home. He said, Mom, this is Mark Bingham. I just want to tell you I love you. I'm on a flight from Newark to San Francisco, and there are three guys on board who've taken over the plane, and they say they have a bomb. Oh, there's another one. Another plane just hit. And then we were oh, cut off. Oh After the call, Alice saw news reports of the planes crashing into the Twin Towers, and now calls Mark back with desperate advice. Mark, this is your mom. Apparently, it's terrorists, and they're hell-bent on crashing the aircraft, so if you can, try to take over the aircraft group some people and perhaps do the best you can to, to get control of it. Uh, I love you, sweetie. Good luck. Bye-bye. Well, I felt pretty impotent and, and uh, helpless uh, leaving those messages. And uh, of course, we were all very worried about Mark, and it, I, w I was pretty desperate to uh, I, I, I really had despaired of ever seeing my son alive again. 
Control of the skies above America is now firmly in the hands of the terrorists. At the Federal Aviation Administration Command Center, Ben Sliney makes a bold decision. I, I honestly felt that at that juncture that uh, we were at war with someone. And I didn't, I couldn't comprehend the scope of it, but I felt I had to do something immediately to try to gain control of the situation. And I gave the order to land all aircraft at the nearest destination. No one had ever shut down the national airspace system uh, prior to that day, but I felt that the best thing to do would be to clear the skies and uh, whatever was left we could, we could manage with. As aircraft land across America, United 93 remains airborne. United 93 continued, and we watched that aircraft as it turned uh, towards the Washington area. Okay, United 93 Go ahead. is 29 miles out of, uh, 29 minutes out of Washington, D.C., and tracking towards it. Okay. Uh, do we want to think about uh, scrambling aircraft? Oh, God, I don't know. Uh, that's a decision somebody's going to have to make probably in the next 10 minutes. But no one notifies the military of United 93's predicament, and the hijackers carry on towards their target. We knew on the ground that United 93 was coming our way. He was going to hit something. On the plane, the terrorists contain the passengers and air crew. From the back of the aircraft, flight attendant C.C. Lyles tries to call her husband. Hi, baby. I'm... Baby, you have to listen to me carefully. I'm on a plane that's been hijacked. I want to tell you I love you. Please tell my children that I love them very much. There's three guys they've hijacked the plane, and I've heard that there's planes that's been, been thrown into the World Trade Center. I hope to be able to see your fans again, baby. I love you. Bye. The plane should have come apart because uh, Zia Jara was flying it so low and so fast. I can't even reflect on how horrible and how frightening that must have been for everybody on board. While some of the passengers fight back and try to retake control of the plane, United 93 crashes in a field near Shanksville, Pennsylvania. 127 miles short of the capital. United 93? Yes. There is a report of black smoke in the, in the last position I gave you. It, it hit the ground. That's speculation only. The military were first notified of the aircraft's hijacking four minutes later. The voices from the airwaves on September 11, 2001, reveal that the U.S. Air Defense and Civil Aviation Administration were completely unprepared, as a new type of war stole the lives of nearly 3,000 people. As a result of the attacks, major changes were made to airport security, and a review of the relationship between civil aviation and the military implemented a radical overhaul. The entire morning was, in my view, characterized by chaos and confusion and uncertainty, trying to figure out what the hell was going on. We had to make up our response as we went along, given that the most time we had was six minutes for notification, and I think the second most time was two minutes. There was just no effective way for us to to respond. I would like to tell people that you know, a lot of people did do their jobs that day, but some of the procedures we had, we weren't prepared for it. We were kind of like a day late and a dollar short. It always sits there in the gut, you know. Um, I can't even explain, because so many other people lost so much more, but it just, it, it just didn't impact me for my life. It was, you know, it was terrible. And uh, 
uh, you couldn't control it. It was out of, you know, um, you know, the scenario we couldn't control.